Turn to Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. Last week we had a look at uh, the church in power and we had a look at the vision of Zechariah and one of the wonderful things we saw is that the church and the people of God, when they have the Spirit of God, are supplied with a continuous supply of power from the Holy Spirit um, to keep our lamps burning. And it is endless, that supply this morning. I want to ask the question, keeping with the theme of the Holy Spirit, and we're glad that it's the day of Pentecost today, and not that we celebrate it in a sense of tradition, uh, but we, do, we are reminded, and I want to ask the question, who is the Holy Spirit to you? Uh, we give thanks. We had some wonderful concerts with the, all the children this week and all the parents, and we give God glory for that. And but uh, we thank the Lord that we can be together. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts uh, chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. And if you're joining us on a pon- podcast this morning, we want to give you a warm welcome as well. We know some are working today. And uh, for our newcomers, very warm welcome to you uh, today as well. May you feel um, comfortable in the house of the Lord. This is the story of Philip, the evangelist, and a little background is that uh, Philip, who was one of the first deacons uh, in the Church of Acts, uh, some years later, we're not sure exactly how long, but he got more into evangelism and uh, became an evangelist and moved around very powerfully, moved by the Holy Spirit and was ministering in Samaria and the towns and and villages, and the word says that uh, multitudes came and came to salvation, whereas they heard the word, and uh, many miracles were done, and by Philip, and people were healed, and so forth. But at this particular time, uh, if we pick up from verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Uh, This is desert. Verse 27 says, So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come up to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. Note the leading of the Spirit in this. Verse 30 says, So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place... In the scripture which he read, this was a eunuch, uh, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth, and in his humiliation his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? So the eunuch asked Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet, and that was Isaiah, say this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Verse 37 says, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them. Now when they came out of the water, the Spirit again of the Lord caught Philip away. 
Now that when they um, saw that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing, but Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And Father, we just pray for your blessing, your anointing on your word, Father, as it goes forth. Lord, may it not just be the letter of the law, but may it be the bread of life to us today. And touch our hearts and lives as we remind ourselves and as we see the wonderful things in your word today. And may we be fed, may we be comforted. We ask us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As I said a moment ago, here we have a very insightful passage. And in asking the question, who is the Holy Spirit to you this morning? I want us to have a look first. Uh, I want to lay a foundation and have a look at some important things. But here we see exactly how Philip, uh, the evangelist, was led by the Spirit. Now, this is not confined to Philip, because remember when Peter uh, preached a little while or some time before this um, in the church of Acts after the day of Pentecost, he said this was a prophetic of the prophecy of Joel, that where the word says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your, your old men shall dream dreams, and so forth. And so the Spirit of God is for every believer, uh, and that's what the promise is, and that promise is still relevant for us today. And so this is what we want to touch on this morning. So as we ask the question, who is the Holy Spirit to you? You may uh, ponder that in your hearts for a moment, and I trust that as we go through this, that God is going to give us a more personal insight, if you like, of the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, of the Trinity. He is God. And so we are going to be having a look at this this morning. First up, I want to say this morning is that we see over here is that Philip is called from crowds to a corner. Okay, Philip is called from crowds to a corner in the desert. Uh, he didn't know who he was going to. Uh, he didn't know what to find. But Philip was very sensitive to the voice of the Spirit. And that we see very clearly this morning. So much so, uh, you could imagine there was revival. Miracles were happening. People were coming to salvation. There were crowds. It was a wonderful time. And yet the Spirit, through an angel, says to Philip, I want you to go uh, to a certain place, to, to Gaza. And Gaza was still there at those time. And, and go to a place that I want to show you in the desert. And Philip, being obedient. I've made the comment here, it's not so much about big names or events but being led by the Spirit is about our obedience to the voice of God. And I want to use the word, the voice of the Spirit. And our obedience is vital in that if we are to obey the call of the Holy Spirit. Um, I've had several instances uh, of this in my own spiritual journey. Um, I know the first notable incident of this uh, uh, same thing was um, 1994, we had been in Sweet Waters for Gospel Church under Ferdy Warwick for about 16 years. I think we had served in virtually every capacity uh, in the church uh, for many years as well, both Jocelyn and myself. And, uh, but at a time uh, when we were waiting on the Lord, an opportunity came up to go to Mombasa in Kenya through my work uh, to start with, and to go and live there with my family. And uh, I can tell you, I did not know what to expect there. Um, I, and we did not receive some good reports about the place. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, we had peace about it. And we had fasted a bit and, and prayed about the matter very seriously. And at first, I wasn't too keen about it, but um, I had peace about it. But I didn't know if there was going to be a church there. 
Um, I didn't know what to expect at all. It was a foreign country. South Africans at the time were not traveling very much. But we believed, and I spoke to our pastor, and he gave us his blessing to go. Um, despite the, at that time, you know, there was like revival in the church. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it, the Spirit was being poured out and miracles were happening and we spoke in tongues and all of these things were happening quite frequently. But to go to a place not knowing where you're going, and it's only when we got there and connected with some missionaries and ended up going to one of the churches in Mombasa, which is a very Islamic place, by the way, the island of Mombasa, and a great Islamic influence over there, that God just gave us a whole new perspective of things. And really, I think in a way that where we were in a very comfortable place, um, we just began to see uh, the church in a much broader perspective. And God really helped us grow and mature for the experience. We ended up being there two years. Later on, we came back to South Africa. And the same thing, we went to Zimbabwe and helped plant an AIDS orphanage with a church plant for three years uh, in Zimbabwe in 1999 and then from to 2022. So we, we became confident that when God's Spirit speaks, uh, if we hear His voice, we can move. And I want to, as we look at this today, look at it in your own life and ask that question, who is the Holy Spirit to me? Who is the Holy Spirit to me? Because he's meant for all of us. And I know God is speaking to people uh, this morning. It was the same when we came to Richards Bay 15 years ago. We were at the house of the Lord in Benoni. It was a big church. We were pastoring there at the time as well. And... Uh, a big church, uh, and we were got a call to a corner somewhere. <laughs> we didn't know much about Richards Bay at all uh, to a different place. And we've been blessed, especially in the school over the time, and just seeing God minister in the lives of the young people. And so we are grateful for that. Secondly, this morning, is we see that Philip is called to one. It's called to one. If we have a look at the Bible, we'll see that Jesus many times ministered to the crowds. He ministered to the multitudes, and he healed them, and there were miracles, and uh, the raising of the dead, blind eyes were open, and, and he preached the gospel to them that the kingdom of God is at hand, and so forth and so forth. But the most precious testimonies in the word of God through the ministry of Jesus and others, is to the one, to the one. Whether it be blind Bartimaeus, whether it be little Zacchaeus being convicted about his thefts and, and, and coming to repentance, uh, whether it be the Samaritan woman at the well, despised, the one who had five husbands, <laughs> uh, considered an outcast, a Samaritan that the Jews didn't like, they considered him a half-race, off breed, uh, but yet Jesus ministered very often. Whether it was Mary, whether it was Martha, whether it was Lazarus, whether it was the demon possessed man called Legion, who miraculously was transformed, a man that chains could even not hold, that was radically changed when Jesus cast out the demons from him. And the people of the city at the time were so amazed that this man that no one could contain was sitting in his right mind in his clothes, dressed, because he used to dwell among the tombs naked, being tormented day and night by many, many demons possessing him. We have precious accounts of the one. I know in my own life and my own testimony as a young man, as a, a teenager, that I met Jesus as a lost person, as one who did not know the Lord as totally alone and lost and, and downhearted and tremendously lonely, I know that through a witness of a, another teenager, I was able to come to salvation and receive the Holy Spirit. And what a wonderful time, what a powerful experience, and more so, I have the presence of the Holy Spirit with me. 
And I remember very powerfully Jesus reaching out to me when I first came to salvation, sometimes in the pub, sometimes in places, and just sensing the presence of the Lord. It's, it sounds quite amazing. But, and he stooped down. You see, Jesus stoops to raise us up. And we ought to stoop to raise others up as well and introduce them to Jesus. Just like Philip over here, he goes to the one. He did not know who this man was. And it so happened that this man was a man of great influence. He was the treasure of Queen Candace, who at the time, history would tell us, was a very great queen of the empire of Ethiopia at the time. The eunuch went on, uh, it is uh, tradition says, and history says, to become a great witness and influence in his country and to the African nations to receive the gospel. Don't think the gospel is something new, <laughs> that it's come here recently. It, it was relatively new to places like Europe and America, but it's been around for a long, long time. It doesn't belong to any people group. It belongs to the Lord. He ministered to the one. We can quote many names, and he didn't know. Uh, whether it be a David called by Samuel, whether it be a Timothy led to faith by his grandmother and mother, or John Wesley through a praying mother, or an Angus Buchan, who we may know but better, to the faithful preaching of a pastor in a little church in Great Town. Um, I remember um, our uh, previous moderator always used to say, you know, he doesn't rejoice so much in the ministry of big names. He rejoices in the faithful people who are faithful to go and minister to the one that those people could take their place. Let us have the same view. Let us never uh, despise ministry to the one. I had a wonderful testimony once, and uh, I'm going to try and remember all of it, but uh, a Philippine lady from the Philippines, uh, was a prostitute all her life. And she was in her like 70s, an old woman. And one day, she came to Jesus and was radically saved and began to minister to all the prostitutes. And then she got married as well <laughs> for the first time. You see, who Jesus makes clean, he makes clean. And if we are sinner and we don't know, we've never heard Jesus will cleanse whatever is in our history, and we can be sure of that if we put our faith in him. You see, the Spirit is given to the believer. The Bible says the world cannot receive the Spirit. They cannot know the Spirit. They cannot see the Spirit. But when we put our faith in Jesus, and whoever's listening, whether you're here or uh, listening on the podcast this morning, have you believed? Have you confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you confessed your sin? He is faithful and true and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from everything that you've ever done and to put you in the place as a child of God. I just want to say that this morning. In fact, statistics prove that by far, most believers, I'm talking about Christians, some quote as much as 98% plus, don't come to Christ through big events or so-called crusades. They come to Christ through one-on-one -on -one witness and building relationships. So I just want to say that this morning, that we can be encouraged. Whoever it is, you might think, well, I'm not a big evangelist. You know, I'm, not, I'm not a minister. I'm not a pastor or anything. But just as you go to your workplace, in your complex or in your circle of influence, just ask the Spirit to use you, and He will. Why? Because faith is a personal and not a group experience. You know, one can give an altar call, and I have sometimes ministering to many people, and a crowd of people can come up because it's in a moment. But that doesn't mean anything unless each person is coming in sincerity and they're coming to commit their lives to Christ. So faith is a personal experience, just like with this Ethiopian eunuch as we see this morning. The Bible says one plants and another waters. And that's very, very true this morning as we see. Now, that leads me to my next point this morning is that Philip 
was led to a seeker. And I want to make a case this morning for being led personally by the Holy Spirit. Philip was led to a seeker. This man, no doubt, had come to worship. He was a Jew from Ethiopia, as for multitudes of countries were Jews at the time, as well of many, many different ethnicities, if you like. And he had come all the way from Ethiopia, had come up to Jerusalem to worship. But yet his faith was incomplete. Like many of the Jews, they did not see Jesus in the Scriptures. And Philip was used just for, it may have been an hour or two, if you just think of it for a moment, to go minister specifically to this man. And that's what makes the Holy Spirit so vital If we're sensitive, God will send us along to the right person just at the right time to speak the right words to them. And that is vital this morning, that we can be his vessel. So Philip was led to a seeker. God knew that this person was ready to receive the gospel. This person was ready to hear about Jesus. He was reading the scriptures, but he did not quite understand what they were talking about. And he needed someone. He needed a human vessel to go and minister to him. And that's what we see in Philip over here. As we continue this morning, we see that the Spirit will always lead you to become an effective witness for Christ. Now, when we, the Bible makes clear in John 3 and the book of Peter and so forth as well, that we are born again by the Spirit of God. The Bible makes clear as well that unless one has the Spirit of God, he's not a Christian, he's not a believer. So when we come to Christ, when we put our faith in Jesus, we say, Lord Jesus, I confess you as Lord of my life. I believe that you've died for my sins. I believe that you rose again. Forgive me, and I declare you as Lord. The Bible says we are born again by the Holy Spirit. At that time, The Holy Spirit takes up residence in our heart. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible teaches us. And that's just a wonderful thought. I'm going to come to it in a moment or two. Uh, And that's really where I want to go with the message this morning, just the personal side of the Holy Spirit. We also have the baptism of the Holy Spirit as at the day of Pentecost, where the Spirit of God was poured out, empowering the believers to become witnesses. So the power or the empowerment that the Spirit gives us, the preparation, the, the separation, if you like, the work the Holy Spirit does in our lives, always is to prepare us as His people to be witnesses. And we see the same over here uh, this morning. John fourteen twenty six says the following. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. The Bible says he's not going to speak of his own, but he's going to take what Jesus speaks and he's going to give it to us. Even though Jesus is in body not present with us no longer, Yet it's the Holy Spirit who takes what he hears Jesus saying and gives it to us and makes it living and gives us understanding in his word. He will teach you all things. John 16, 13, 14 says similarly, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Friends, family of God, hear us this morning. If you're worried about the future, (laughs) if you worry about the direction maybe the country is going, uh, as Christians, we needn't be in the dark at all. As believers, we just need to rely on the Holy Spirit because he will tell you. No man can tell you. People can guess. Politicians can try and tell you. Uh, Notable figures and learned people can try and tell you what will happen, but they don't know. They don't even know where they will be tomorrow, to be honest with you. 
I don't even know if they'll be here tomorrow, like all of us. But the Holy Spirit, with His leading, if we're sensitive to His voice, that's why Jesus would often say, let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. Now, I've overcome the world. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing in the world. I know the work. Let's get on board with Him, and then we need not be afraid. He will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. God directs our paths in all things, the Bible says. Acknowledge the Lord in all your ways, and He will direct your paths. I'm of the habit, and as the Bible says, uh, pray about everything. Don't, don't worry. Let not your heart be troubled, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, in everything, we can present our requests to God. Acknowledge the Lord in all your ways, and He will direct your paths. And that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the wonderful ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Things become clearer, and this is very important, when we take that first step of obedience. Remember Abraham when he was first called out, go to a place that I will show you. Uh, A place that I'm going to give you as your inheritance. Uh, Abraham did not know the details. In fact, the Bible says uh, that Abraham went going. You see, he took that step of obedience. He went going not knowing. Some of us spend our whole lives, like with Philip over here, he didn't know what to expect. He didn't know who he was going to. He could not have known that. But he had to just step out of that place he was ministering in and take that step of faith and obedience, and then God showed him very, very clearly and in much more detail exactly why he was there. And that's very, very important. Some of us spend our whole lives, we want God to do something first, which by the way he has done, he's already given his son for us to die on the cross for our sins, but we need to take that step of faith. We need to take a step of faith to follow Jesus, to surrender our lives to him. And as we do that, listen folks, as we do that, things will become clearly or clearer. As we begin to walk in the things we do know, what the Bible says to us through his word, God will show us the next steps. And that's the important thing we, we see over here. So whether you're Peter being called to step out of the boat at Jesus' call, or like Joshua, when you first need to place your foot and lead the people over the Jordan River, or like Moses with a rod, you have to take that step of obedience. Uh, I like to use uh, this analogy. I like adventure films. I don't watch many movies, but uh, if I do watch some, it's adventure. And I used to like some of the, uh, I can't even remember their name now, but um, uh, but uh, the, the one movie they got to speak, Chasm. And the man takes the step, and there's no steps there. And but as he puts his foot forward, yeah, a, a rock appears. <laughs> and as he puts another step forward, yeah, another rock appears. And as he does that, and as he walks, the next steps appeared. Your word is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. As I use his word for a lamp to my feet, I only see yeah. You know what? My paths start brightening up. I start seeing the next section of the road. And that we have that beautiful passage in Scripture. Philip responded, or Philip's responded with haste and enthusiasm. The Bible says that when he was, maybe we should just read it again. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go in here and overtake this chariot. So now he is getting more guidance. So Philip ran to him. In fact, I just want to say, when we hear the voice of the Spirit, when we know the Word of God, do not delay to obey. I often like to remind ourselves that delayed obedience is actually disobedience. If we know something, we know the truth of the Scripture, the Spirit is leading for something, into something, do not delay to obey And here we see that enthusiasm, that passion that he ran uh, once he heard the voice of God uh, to be obedient to the Lord. Philip responded with haste and 
enthusiasm. The Bible also tells us in another place that if we grieve the Holy Spirit long enough, God says my spirit will not always strive with man. And we can go into that this morning. Uh, so if you're not sensitive to his still small voice, soon other voices, the voices of this world, the voices of others, my own desires will begin to drown out that voice of the Holy Spirit. As I conclude this morning, we see that the Spirit uses those prepared. Philip had sufficient knowledge of the Scriptures to be readily available and able to effectively teach and lead the eunuch to Christ. Let me just say something. First Peter 3.15 says, Always be ready. It says, always be ready to give an answer to any man or everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. So as Christians, the Bible says, speaking to the church, let us always be ready. Let us always be available to give a reason for the hope that is in us for anyone who asks us. So once someone says, why are you different? <laughs> what is it about you? then we need to be ready, and it's good always to remember some good scriptures. You know, John 3.16, and why Jesus died for us, John 1.9, and so forth. Uh, and as we become more equipped, God will use us more and more as well. But that does not mean that we need to go on a whole lot of study or do some theology course before we can witness. No. Remember the Samaritan woman? Uh, she heard Jesus and she immediately shared her testimony. The blind man who was healed and the Pharisees or the teachers of the law tried to get in an argument with him and, and uh, uh, disparage who Jesus was and put him down. And the blind man says, look, um, I don't know <laughs> what you say about him, or, but all I do know that I was once blind and now I see. That is our testimony as Christians. We were once blind for every born-again believer, but now we see. I don't have to get into all the theology of it. As a Christian, I can prepare myself, the Bible says, as a vessel of honor to be fit for the master's use. And that is important over there. Be ready. Be prepared to share your testimony. That takes prayer. That takes a quiet time. And if we do that, God will use us. And finally this morning, is once you've completed the task, the Spirit leads you to his next assignment. And there we see it. Now when they came out of the water, once uh, Philip had baptized uh, the eunuch, uh, it says the Spirit caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. That was the eunuch. But Philip was found at Azotus and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. We see here that Philip had a small yet essential role in this important person's life. But so it is for each one of us, and that we need to be reminded uh, of that. There were no doubt others involved in a eunuch spiritual growth and his journey and maturity. And as the word says, one plants and another waters, but God gives the increase. I want to conclude this morning to ask that question again, do you know him? And sure, we can read about the Holy Spirit. He is our helper. He is our advocate. He is called to indwell us as the temple of God. He is a guarantee of our salvation. In fact, the word says that the deposit, the, the down payment until we are fully redeemed in glory, the Bible says, is a guarantee. And that's why it's so vital to have the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He is our guide. He is our power. And some people, I know many, they're looking for some sort of power from the Holy Spirit. And they don't realize his power is to, for us to be his witnesses, to strengthen us in our walk, to help us not just to do a whole lot of things that we want to do. He's our teacher. He leads into all truth. He tells us things to come. But who is the Holy Spirit to you? 
Let me try and illustrate a little more. And I, I think most of us are probably not old enough to know that much about Nelson Mandela. But let's just use him as an example, a former president. Um, one could come to someone and say, do you know Nelson Mandela, the Honorable President Nelson Mandela? They'll say, sure, I know him. <laughs> but they're saying that because they've heard about him, they've read some stories about him, they know his biography, etc., etc. But do they really know him? No. The vast majority would not know him. The only ones who know him would be his immediate family, be those who had a relationship, an actual relationship with him. You see, we can know about Jesus. We can know about church. We can move around from church to church and fancy ourselves as someone. But do we know the Holy Spirit? Do we know Jesus, of whom the Holy Spirit ministers this morning personally? It's a vital thought, because unless we know him, because that leads to the next question. If I know him personally, how do I treat the Holy Spirit? Am I mindful of his presence within me? That's why Paul had to speak to the Corinthian church and, 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 and warn them and, and tell them, uh, do you not know that if you become one with a prostitute, <laughs> do you not know that your body is or the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now you might not say, I don't do that, but sometimes we can look at lustful images. And Jesus said, even if we look at a lustful image and lust after someone else, another woman or another man for that matter, we commit adultery in our heart. Are we cognizant then of the Holy Spirit who he is in our lives? How do we treat the Holy Spirit? The Bible says he's able to be resisted. He's able to be grieved. We can do things that grieve the Holy Spirit in our walk. Why? Because he's with us. We can make him do things that are displeasing to God, that do not honor Christ. We can ignore him. We can exalt, insult the Spirit, the Bible says, the Spirit of grace. Who is the Holy Spirit to you? And I want us afresh on this day, and not only on this day, but going forward. And that can be, in a way, a little bit of a disadvantage of just celebrating Pentecost as some sort of tradition. And we need to be mindful of who the Holy Spirit is every day and to be led by the Spirit every day. And as I close this morning, and let me just read John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commands, Jesus said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Holy Spirit is not given to us just for a season, just while we are on earth, but he is one given to us who will abide with us forever and ever. And that just speaks of our relationship with God. You see, when the Spirit comes into our lives, we become children of God. We become sons and daughters of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called children of God. And that is so powerful and profound that we cannot fully understand it. That's why John says we don't know and we cannot fully get the picture of what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I will not leave you as orphans, Jesus said, but I'll send forth another helper, another comforter. So who is the Holy Spirit to you? Are you mindful? Are you conscious of his presence? And if you are not this morning, it means you've never really truly accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Well, certainly you're not practicing that. And it's not meant as a rebuke today. 
or chiding, but as an invitation and to all of us, whether we have never accepted Jesus Christ or whether we're not practicing or following Jesus, or whether we've walked f- uh, with the Lord for many years, are we allowing, do we just know about all the attributes of the Holy Spirit? Or are they very real in our lives? John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. It was an old song, he's big enough to rule this mighty universe, yet small enough to dwell within my heart. Maybe walk away here with a new sensitivity, a new appreciation of who the Holy Spirit is. If the Holy Spirit is nothing to you, what a tragic place to be. That would mean we are none of His. But as believers, we are called to be mindful of His holy presence. That's why the Word says, without holiness, it's Him who makes us holy. Of His holy presence, we need to honor Him. In our decisions, we need to surrender. And someone said, this world has yet to see a man besides Jesus fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage us this morning, just begin to envision what your life could look like, being fully led by the Spirit. And let us bow our heads. Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, I'm mindful that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He will not force himself upon us. And Lord, as your minister and under-shepherd, I do not want to force the Holy Spirit upon everyone, but I want to hold forth the word of life this morning for all of us. And Father, it's for us to take it. Lord, we can continue with our struggles. We continue, can continue with trying to do things our own way. We can continue with our depression. We can continue with our downheartedness. In lowliness, even in miserableness. Or we can receive your word. We can receive Jesus and receive your Spirit. We can yield to your Holy Spirit. And that's an invitation this morning. There are some here today, listeners, whether here or on the podcast, maybe you have no hope, you're constantly depressed. I just want to ask one question. Consider your track record, your beliefs, the way of doing things. Has it brought you joy? Is there daily comfort? Is there provision? Do you have peace? That's the question we need to ask ourselves this morning. Because that invitation, if we carry on doing it our own way, and many are like that, we don't want to surrender because we, we prefer. We prefer that way, just to do things our own way. Sometimes the Bible says we even prefer sin. We don't want to give up our lives. We don't want to give up sinful pleasures. But where are they leading you? Do you have joy? Do you have hope? Do you have eternal life this morning? Where is your ways leading you? And that's what I want to ask while heads are bowed. If you want to make a decision to accept the Lord Jesus Christ this morning as your personal Savior, Because in doing that, you will receive the Holy Spirit. You will be born again from a child of the devil to a child of God. I'm not asking you, I'm not talking churchy things this morning. I'm not talking about, you might say, ah, but I'm religious, I belong to this church, or my parents were Christians. That's got nothing to do with it. Who is the Holy Spirit to you? Do you want to hold on to your old things? Or do you want to surrender today? If there's anyone who wants to surrender, put up your hand. I'll pray for you. I've got no problem. I'll gladly do that this morning. Anyone at all.
you feel you're at a place where you don't know the answers anymore, that there is no hope. If that's you today and you want to surrender your life unconditionally to the Lord, then slip up your hand, I'll pray for you. To the believer this morning, to those who know Jesus, who is the Holy Spirit to you in practice every day? Do you revere him? Do you honor him? Do you make yourself sensitive? Do you spend time with him in the word, in prayer, in asking him to lead you? There is no bounds. I want to tell you this morning, there's no Nothing that can hold one back. And God will give us more than we ask or think as we surrender and continue to surrender our lives to the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning that we can be found in your presence. I pray for the year is here today, for the listeners who will listen later. Lord, that we would be word afresh, that we would be challenged afresh, Father. Lord, it's so profound, it's so amazing, Lord, just to think that you yourself dwell within us in form of your Holy Spirit forever, that we are not just created men or women or beings, but we are sons and children, and that is our destiny, that is our future, not the things of this world that are passing, the things of this dark world, but we are children of light, and we thank you that you yourself have made your home with us as we have believed. And so I pray that that truth may again just settle freshly in our hearts and in our minds. And Lord, that every day we might have a new appreciation, Lord, a greater love, and that we might continue to grow, to cherish you and to honor you, to listen to your voice more and more. We ask us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you so much for hearing this morning. Thank you for being with us. And this time I want to invite the worship team. We're going to close the service with a song this morning. Uh, Janine, come forward and help with the offering. Uh,